We've been speaking about what is a controller, and you've spent two tutorials interacting with controllers in a non-mathematical way, right? Um, in the first tutorial, we just took up the C TC lab and so on, and in the second tutorial, you actually uh, sat there for how long ever uh, trying to get particular characteristics out of these process control curves. So by now, when I draw a curve like this, and I tell you that that's the set point, and that's T1, um, you know, on a, on a temperature curve, that looks to you probably like the kinds of curves that you saw when you had a PID controller controlling the temperature. In tutorial two, you will remember that I asked you uh, to figure out with a given integral time constant what the largest value of the gain is that you could get uh, that would still result in that kind of response. And you'll see that in the book there's a couple of sketches that, that kind of explains that the larger the gain becomes in a PID controller, uh, the more, so in other words, this is the direction of larger gain, right? And hopefully, if you actually forced yourself, now those of you who actually forced yourself to use the physical device would have gotten the best version of this experience. But if you uh, used the model and you sl slid the speed up switch all the way to the right, hopefully that limit on the speed up switch is still small enough that you felt vague irritation at having to wait uh, for these things to become clear. And that is really the motivating experience of the entire field of control analysis. It turns out that there are undesirable values for the controller parameters. And if, we, if we're just focusing on PID control first, in the case of PID control, we have a couple of interesting questions. We saw, or you saw, that in general, larger gain is associated with better control. But it is also associated with oscillation and very large gains are often associated with unstable responses. So on a high level, it becomes quite pressing to us to say what kind of limits exist to the gain that I can use in the system. And how can I calculate those limits so that I can experiment uh, safely without running the risk of putting a setting onto the controller that will cause things to break. If you played around with that gain slider enough, if you had some integral time constant, you would be able to find a gain that when you slide that gain slider far enough to the right, eventually it just blows up. What you will see, of course, is that this unstable response, from a mathematical point of view, um, will actually, from a realistic point of view, not look like, so this is a, this is a unstable response mathematically, right? Unstable response mathematically is, is unbounded. And you'll remember from last year that we had this kind of operational definition of stability where we said stability is all about bounded inputs leading to bounded outputs, right? And if I put in a bounded input, like maybe a step change in the set point, or maybe a small change in the disturbance that is, again, also bounded, um, I expect, I hope, that a well-tuned controller will be able to keep all the control at least bounded. If this happens, this is what blowing up looks like. Um, if I draw an abstract mathematical graph that represents a... a, a failure like a cylinder blowing up on site. That's what it would look like, right? Because realistically, so in the ideal case, 
The ideal math says instability is associated with these unbounded outputs, but realistically, what actually happens is if, if, we, if we think about the TC lab, if we think about Q, Q is limited to be between 0 and 100, right? And so Q can't go unbounded. The best it can do, we can maybe start at 50%. We can see some kind of response like this. And what we'll in, end up seeing eventually is this, right? Where it's going 100% open and 0%, well, you know, all the way closed. And this, if we look at the temperature, that same graph, that temperature will eventually just end up cycling. And so we can't actually see in practice an unbounded response because something will break first or we'll hit some kind of stopper somewhere. We don't see valves going to minus 250 degree, or 250% open and 500% open because they can't. We don't see levels going to 500 meters because actually what happens is the level goes up until the top of the tank and then stops stops, right? And we, our feet get wet. So that's what instability looks like in practice, is that the equations change and we end up not having, we don't see these kind of mathematical ideal unstable situations. But, of course, we want to know that this, ha that this happens before it happens. The reading for next week is uh, all about the actual calculations of how would we do the math? And so this is what we're trying to do now in chapter 10, is we've seen this behavior in fir first hand. We've seen that uh, it takes a long time. It's very tedious to kind of find good controller parameters. We've seen that it's dangerous. It's dangerous in the sense that sometimes when you choose a particular value and you're not looking the right way, you end up blowing up your plant. On your TC lab, this looks like if, if, remember, if you reach one of those limits, you may have blown up your plant. Luckily, the TC lab is nice and safe. But a lot of times, if you get, if you get close to those control limits, this is a bad idea. So we want a safe way to be able to explore that without doing harm to our plant, and we want a faster way than trial and error. Because doing trial and error in real time on a plant, remember, real plants are not as fast as your TC lab, right? Real plants with a big distillation column somewhere, we're talking about six hours to reach steady state behavior on kind of normal size, secunda size distillation column. So that's not fun. It's not fun sitting there. I mean, even just the step testing, people who have done te step testing will tell you, you know, you're sitting there for a couple of days, babysitting the plant, making sure things don't break, just moving something and seeing what happens, capturing the data so that you can get. So we're talking about an investment of days. We are hoping to reduce that down. And our strategy, as always, the same way that you are using equations to model equipment instead of building small versions and seeing whether that works, right? Because remember, trial and error in your other subjects, if you designed a heat exchanger by trial and error, what would you do? You'd, you'd take a couple of pipes and put them together and then see, does this actually transfer the amount of heat that I need to transfer? You'd say, no, it doesn't yet. I need more tubes. Now you add some tubes and you see how that works. And with the physical stuff, it's so obvious that that's a bad strategy that like very few of us will consider it. Um, but with control, with electronic stuff, it seems like it should be okay, but it's not because the time is still too long. So we're going to figure out what the mathematical relationships are that describe all the parts of the controller. And so you'll remember 
So we've got this thing called GC, we've got this thing called GP. You'll remember that we basically spent a whole semester Okay, this box over here, that was the subject CPN320. So we spent a whole semester thinking, how will we write down the equations that describe GP? Now, in study theme one, we spent a couple of weeks thinking about how will we write down equations that describe the most common version of GC? And how does the math work that allows these controllers to operate? So that's the simplified version of this. And what you're seeing in, uh, in the, the textbook now, in chapter 10, is that we're expanding that simplified view to zoom in and show more of the actual physical components and kind of tease out those particular models. So what we see is this thing. So, ooh, sorry. So this thing. We've already discussed that length. We are going to write down most of the time in chapter 10. We will pretty much only analyze in chapter 10 that uh, thing as the ideal PI parallel form uh, PID controller. Okay, so for most of chapter 10, that's going to be everything we do is going to be some version of that. Uh, and in fact, most of the initial work is going to be focused on the proportional mode only. So most of the math in chapter 10 is going to be simple in terms of the controller. Um, but we're going to expand out or zoom out that box. And we're going to say, right, there's maybe an actual plant itself. Or let's say, let's say kind of a tank or whatever, right? And that's going to have a transfer function. Then there's going to be an actual device called a valve. And that's going to have a transfer function of its own. which we'll often call GV. And for our purposes, in most cases, valves are going to be, look, realistically, when that towel over there is very large, the valve is going to be so fast in comparison to the process that we'll ignore it in most cases. But it's useful to remind yourself, and it, this is why they're laying like a lot of groundwork here, to say, remember, it's not just the tank. The tank is connected to a valve. The valve is not directly connected to the controller. It is connected to a thing called an IP converter because in most cases we, these days, we have electronic controllers. And electronic controllers don't have a place where I can plug in the pneumatics. They have a place where I can plug in a wire. And I need a transducer, which is the fancy word for anything that changes one form of energy or relates one form of energy to another. So I need an ITP transducer, which is a thing that takes an electronic signal and produces a pressure that is proportional to that on the other side. So I need one of those. And that thing is going to, again, realistically, it does have some dynamics, just like a light switch has dynamics, right? So if I, if I move my light switch, most of us would assume that the lights come on immediately. But anybody who spent some time like watching slow motion videos on YouTube knows that there's time, right? Like there's actual time that it takes like a light bulb uh, filament to 
glow up. If you slow down time enough, like even a light bulb, which looks instantaneous, actually takes time to get to the eventual uh, light output. Uh, so much of this is kind of conventional slash knowledge of how different time scales work. ITP converters are typically an order of mag magnitude faster than valves, and they typically are an order of magnitude faster than the... When I say faster in this context, I mean they've got time constants that are in that kind of order of magnitude. You know, so plants are usually time constants of many minutes or hours if you're talking about a largish plant. The time constant of a valve is typically in seconds, you know, so if we're talking about hours to seconds, that's an order of magnitude. And then the I2P kind of uh, circuitry, that has time constants which is like in the millisecond range. So that part of what's happening is we're saying that simplified view actually from the point of view of the controller remember so the controller sits here and it outputs an electronic signal right and on the other side is like real world stuff on the interface sits this transducer that it's taking the electronic signal from the controller it's transducing that to a signal that can actually move stuff like a pressure signal there's an actual valve the valve is in connection with the plant itself and then it becomes even more problematic because over here so the actual real plant we will model we will problematize in two different ways. We will say that there's an extra input over here, which is the disturbance, right? So there's the actual plant that I think of as the thing that actually does the thing that I want to do, that I designed to do. I've put that valve in there with intent. I built this thing, I put the valve there, but if, the valve, if that tank, for instance, is open outside, what happens when it rains? I, I haven't filled my pool for a couple of weeks now because I don't have to. I don't have to take action to fill my pool. I just sit around and water comes from the sky and fills my pool. Now, this happens obviously on plants as well, right? So if you have an open tank, if it rains, the level will go up. This is just how it goes. So there will be an effect on that plant, or on that tank level, which is not within your control. It just happens. Rain is one, but also just other plants. You may choose not to know whether they are actually sending material your way. See our previous discussion about things costing money. So it costs money to measure things. So every time you don't measure something that does have an effect on your plant, that's another disturbance. Well, even if you do have the opportunity to measure it, if you're not manipulating it, it's a disturbance. So even if there's a valve there, but the valve is being controlled or being manipulated by some other controller, that still counts as a disturbance. Right? And so now we have our actual Y, but as I've mentioned before, we don't actually know in the control room really what is happening. What we know is what is printed on our screen. And I, I, I made this point a lot last year, but I think I had a discussion with somebody the other day which made me think that it, it hadn't really uh, completely sunk in. And this is this idea that in general, um, the measurement of something is not equal to the thing itself. Definitely, when things are changing and when there is some dynamics associated with the measurement, this is true. So I want to kind of just dig into that again. So here's the, here's the full block diagram. So we have some, uh, something over here which is called the measurement, and that, in general, again, is going to have a... There's going to be a transfer function associated with that. So... Uh, in the book, you'll see that sometimes they will follow this convention. And again, this is just conventional. Don't, don't put too much stock in it. If, definitely, if I 
slip into, uh, and I just want to kind of clarify, I use two textbooks <laughs> when I lecture control. I use this textbook when I lecture undergraduate control, and I use a different textbook when I lecture postgraduate control. The postgraduate control book uses different notation from the undergraduate control book, uh, which means that I will from time to time slip between the two notations, as you may have seen me do before. You know, so the, the postgraduate control book doesn't use YSP, it just uses Y. Or uh, it doesn't use YSP, it uses R, which is the reference. So these are widely used. That book also just uses K for the entire controller transfer function, even if it is a full transfer function. And so I don't attach the very specific meaning. Seaborg is pretty consistent with using G if there's dynamics and K if there isn't dynamics. But understand that that's more of Seaborg's convention than anything else. It's definitely, I don't make that connection because I'm writing Ks with dynamics all the time when I do postgraduate. So just understand, I don't have that contract with you. Um, I could write K, meaning the controller, um, with dynamics. The only way that you would know is because I will tell you this is something with dynamics. If you are confused or if you feel that like you need more clarification, put up your hand during the test. Do not assume that K just automatically means it won't contain dynamics. Okay, so anyway, we've got a couple of these pieces of dynamics. In general, there will be dynamics for the, for the measurement as well. Um, and again, if you think about, let's just extend this a little bit. So the electronic version of this, again, kind of lies, that, that, that electronic line lies around there. So typically that uh, measurement uh, equipment will be a transducer of some kind. In other words, a thermocouple, for instance, takes a thermal energy and translates that to a voltage difference. So a thermocouple by itself is a transducer. Things like strain gauges, which take pressure differences and translate them to electronic signals are transducers. So all of those kinds of things lie on this electronic physical barrier uh, just by virtue of being a measuring device. So typically we won't dig too far into the extra dynamics of uh, that transduction. I'm just trying to explain why there's a transducer on the electronic physical barrier between the controller and the system, which we have this IP converters clearly put in there, but why there's not that same kind of uh, piece of equipment over here, right? So because that thing is a transducer, right? The units over here and the units over there are different. Because remember, if we're adding things together over here in, it, in the electronic domain, all of these signals conceptually will be electronic signals. Maybe they're milliamp signals, right? This thing over here may be a temperature or a level. And it's the measuring device that's responsible for doing that transduction. So we're unpacking, right? We're making this a little bit harder, digging in and saying, where are the things that we need to take uh, uh, that we need to take into account when we do our analysis. We need to take into account that there, is a lot, there are a couple of changes of units that happen. The controller outputs a particular thing in the electronic signal, units, and then the system responds to a pressure signal in pressure units. And so we need to kind of keep that in mind as we carry through so that we can calculate the various gains uh, correctly when we work out what the overall gains are. I want to show, so I hope that gives a little bit more, Seaborg kind of goes into this detail very quickly. The reason why we're doing this, just remember the beginning of the lecture, the reason why we're doing this is because we want to write down mathematical models that describe these closed loop systems. The reason why we want to do that is because most of the time, the most important thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we choose the correct controller parameters that aren't going to blow up our plant. And we're going to translate blowing up the plant into the stability of the plant. So we're going to be quite focused next week on figuring out what causes or what limits are placed on the parameters of the controller 
by the system. How do we know whether the system will be stable in closed loop? We'll be doing those calculations a lot next week. You'll see 10.3 is basically all about that. Um, but I also want to, uh, you to understand why uh, it's important for us to kind of keep all of these dynamics in mind because this idea, right, so we know we have to take in the, into account these dynamics because they actually take, uh, they, they have dynamics. This thing we'll ignore a lot of the time, but I want you to understand that as that temperature moves, let's say this is our TC lab temperature. What you see on your screen is actually the measured temperature, right? So when the TC lab, when you plug in your TC lab, remember that uh, on your TC lab, we have something like the heater, right? And that's a little uh, relay or that's a little transistor. And then we have this uh, temperature sensing package, which is linked to that. And so these things are wired like this, right? So this is the, this little black thing that's on here. That's the thing that is reporting its temperature. But remember, it's not reporting. There are temperatures in a gradient across that entire physical piece of equipment. We've made some simplifying assumptions. Last year, you made some simplifying assumptions about which of those temperatures we could assume to be completely homogeneous, but they are not. That's the first thing you need to understand. So, it's not really accurate to talk about the temperature, right? Because there isn't one single temperature. Typically, this part, this part is going to be hot. And then that part is going to be a little bit less hot. And then that part is going to be even less hot. There's going to be this gradient of temperatures. So when we say, on my screen, I'm seeing a temperature for T1, what does that even mean? Right? It's definitely not the temperature of that whole unit. At best, we can say it's the temperature which is being sensed in the middle of that packet of the actual temperature sensing package. So what that means is the actual temperature of the below, let's say a temperature over there, if we, if we take a section over here, remember there's now this little gob of uh, thermal paste that's connected there. If that's T1, right, if that's the actual T1, this is T1 measured, and this is what I see. So T1 typically will be leading that temperature. In other words, T1 will change, and then T1M will change. Does that make sense? Definitely, if while things are moving, and at any given time, while T1 is going up, our measurement will be low. In other words, because our measuring instrument has dynamics, it will be under measuring when the temperature is going up, right? Similarly, it will over measure when the temperature is going down. And we can only really be sure when there is measurement dynamics, that what I'm seeing on the screen is the same as the thing that I'm imagining is being measured, if I have not seen changes for a long time. Now, I think this is obvious to everybody who just does a bit of introspection. Anybody who's ever been ill and stuck a thermometer in their mouth will understand that that thermometer is showing the wrong temperature almost all of the time you have it in your mouth. Does that make sense? Because you take it from ambient, uh, you take it from ambient, you put it in your mouth, and what happens? It's weird. Like your your body just suddenly heats up, right? Like you you start with a body temperature of twenty something degrees, and then over time your body heats up. No, this is not what happens, right? Actually, it's just the measurement. It's the number that's displayed on the thermometer that changes. 
your body stays the same temperature all the time. So that measurement for all of that time is wrong. Right? So your body temperature is over here. And this is approximately actually what happens, right? Because probably your mouth is always going to be a little bit lower temperature than your actual core body temperature. And so even when it like settles out, it's not measuring like your core core body temperature. It's measuring maybe a little, a bit, a little bit lower. This is the problem of measurement. During this entire time, it's wrong, right? Over here, you can say, well, it's kind of settled out, so now it's at least giving a reliably, uh, perhaps a little bit low, but like the most reliable temperature it's ever going to give. But then I take it out of my mouth. So most of the time, that thermometer is showing the wrong temperature on its screen, which means most of the time that you're in the control room, if things are changing on site, the measurements are not correct most of the time. And so it's important to keep that in mind. It's important to understand that that measurement, you shouldn't be fooled to imagine that you can trust the measurements. You can trust your eyes much more than you can trust the measurements. So the guy outside radioing in and saying what's happening is probably getting a better picture of what's happening than you're getting inside of the control room. So we have to keep that in mind while we're, while we're doing this control design. 